Hello and welcome back to Tinker Talks Guns. Today we're here to talk about the Ivor Johnson 38 Double Action Safety Hammerless Third Model. And yes, the fact that it's a third model matters. We're also going to get to look at a couple of bonus guns so that I can show you why it matters. So, in 1891, Ivor Johnson Firearms and Cycle Works began to produce a line of compact self-defense oriented pistols and typical to the time these were in chambered in 32 Smith and Wesson and 32 or 38 Smith and Wesson which you know their cartridges are very modest power by modern standards but they were very typical in their day for small concealable revolvers and they made hammerless and hammer versions of these guns and they changed fairly quickly with the final change coming in um, near 1909 to the third model, which their great claim was that it was safe for smokeless powder. Of course, they had a lot of leftover parts from their second model revolvers, and they continued to produce them under another brand. U.S. Revolver Company, and they were also safe for smokeless powder, despite being made from parts of the second models that notionally worked. I'm not recommending you go out and load piss and hot reloads for 38 and 32 Smith and Wesson, but at the time smokeless powder cartridges were introduced, every revolver was a black powder revolver and they formulated the loads accordingly. Modern factory ammunition is loaded to that same specification for the standard loads. I'm not talking about Buffalo Bores super hot loads or anything like that. Just the standard load in 38 had a 147 grain bullet moving out at a modest 700 50 feet per second or so. And again, these loads are perfectly safe to shoot in the black powder guns. <laughs> Let's get to the tabletop so I can show you this and a couple of other revolvers to explain this in greater detail. Okay, first things first, we'll unload and show clear. No cartridges. Now, this is like most top brakes, like almost all top brakes, auto ejecting which means the extractor star pops the empty cases out when you open the gun leaving it ready to be reloaded and you can in fact use j-frame smith and wesson speed loaders with this gun the thing is that in practice this is not actually any faster than a conventional swing out cylinder revolver believe me i've tried so to talk more about this gun, we need to first show you some older guns. This is a, a first model 38, Ivor Johnson 38 safety hammerless. As you can see, it has the Glock safe trigger and is rather more svelte. And other notable things is that when the trigger is not pressed, the cylinder can free rotate. And this is typical of a lot of the less expensive guns of this type. Now, the third model, the cylinder is locked when at rest. So even after you release the trigger, the cylinder remains locked and this is a better system. And as you can see, it's a bit chunkier than the Model 1, and more importantly, it has four pins. You can see the Model 1 has only two, and I think the Model 2 has three, but don't quote me on that. So a lot of people will point out that the owl head on the grip is now facing on this axis, and on the older guns, it faces forward, or the tin faces forward. And some people will say this is how you tell the difference between a first or second model and a third model, 
and that is highly unreliable because the grips interchange and people change the grips over the years and sometimes these grips break and when people replace them they replace them with what they could get and probably weren't real careful to make sure that they didn't put number two grips on their number three gun. So the definitive difference, four pins and the cylinder locks. If that's not obvious enough for you, you probably shouldn't be handling dangerous things like firearms. Now, as you can see, the Model 1 and the Model 2, the standard barrel was three and a quarter inches long. This gun came with a three and a quarter inch barrel. And at some point in the past, long past, the gun was shortened to one and three quarter inches, no doubt to make it more suitable for pocket carry or carry in a coat or jacket. And uh, they did, quote, improve the sights, unquote. And um, <laughs> honestly, I guess it's better, but the sights are pretty terrible. And as you can see, the Model 1 and 2, the sight was even smaller. And the blade is exceptionally narrow. So this would have been fairly difficult sights to use. So these are a little better and the short barrel actually improves this because the front and rear sight are close enough together that they're on the same focal plane. So you can be focused on both sights simultaneously. And in practice, this means that you can shoot these guns surprisingly accurately when they have the short barrel. Um, with my Smith & Wesson with a 1 and 5 8 inch barrel, I shoot 4 inch groups at 25 yards. And that's not shabby, especially for a snub nose revolver. The auto eject mechanism in these is very similar to Smith & Wesson, which is very similar to H&R. They're all pretty much of a piece. Uh, latches very, very little also. And the function is pretty much identical across all of these revolvers. They were very, very popular. But they had some issues. First of all, there's 38 Smith & Wesson. This is a cartridge of relatively modest power, maybe comparable to 380 on a good day. This is 38 Special. Not only is it longer, it's significantly more powerful. And putting it in a top brake revolver <sighs> would be detrimental to the lifespan of the revolver because the action is inherently less strong than a solid frame with a swing out cylinder. And so once smokeless powder cartridges of greater power were introduced, the top brakes days were numbered. Not only is it inherently a weaker mechanism, it's also more expensive to produce. And as stated previously, despite what you might think, it's not actually faster to reload than a conventional revolver with a swing out cylinder. Now this gun has a, it's double action only obviously, and the trigger pull is about nine pounds maybe nine and a half. And um, it's very, very smooth, even in an inexpensive revolver like this, so it's quite manageable. But I wouldn't want to mess with it and try and make it better, because A, that's not the sort of gun this is, and B, they're a pain in the ass to get the innards out because it's a solid frame with no side plates. Now, I've left the stock grips on this one. You can see on the Model 2, I've made a set of antler grips because antler is cool. But these grips were broken when I got the gun. And yes, this gun has been refinished. This is not the original finish. So with the original grip broken, I felt no need not to replace it with much cooler antler grips. This gun still has the stock grip. And as an interesting note, the stock grips on the almost identically sized Smith & Wessons absolutely do not work for me, despite being practically identical in shape and size. This one 
actually works for me. Some subtle aspect of the ergonomics or whatever, but it does work. Anyway, it's a fun gun. I think I paid a hundred bucks for it. And um, it's fun to shoot. It's kind of nice to shoot. I don't shoot it as much as I might because, well, frankly, my comparable Smith & Wesson is a lot better. Um, <laughs> but I keep it around. I just, something about it I just like. Sort of pugnacious looking. And if you look around, guns like this can regularly be had in the $100 to $200 range. And if you reload, because this ammo is difficult to find and um, rather expensive and often not correct. Um, Remington, and maybe Winchester, uh, took to using shortened 38 special cases, which are slightly smaller in diameter, and using .357 bullets. And I found out years ago, shooting a British Victory model in 38 Smith & Wesson, that those bullets tend to keyhole. So you're better off hand loading your own because the factory ammo is suspect and expensive and hard to find. If you do reload, these can be very pleasant, enjoyable revolvers to shoot. Like any antique, it is prudent to use lightweight loads in them to save wear and tear on the gun. And after all, it's just for fun anyway. You don't need a powerhouse round. Absolutely do not fire the Buffalo Bore 38 Smith & Wesson in these guns or any other top rig, except an Enfield or Webley, which are designed for a heavier load. I said this before, but it bears repeating. Guns like this, while safe to fire with factory anemic loads in smokeless powder, you don't want to overdo it. These guns are all over a hundred years old, or almost all. And you don't know what's been done to them or what they've been through. It's a very good idea before firing these guns to have them examined by someone competent to judge whether or not it is safe to fire. And if that's you, that's great. If not, best to take it to a gunsmith. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, fewer and fewer gunsmiths these days are actually well-versed in antique guns like this, so it could be problematic getting someone to vet it for you. The rule is with any antique gun, always, when in doubt, don't. Okay? It's not worth risking injury to yourself just to shoot a neat old gun. Ivor Johnson made a lot of guns, almost all of them self-defense revolvers, at least in terms of handguns. They also made some 22 caliber plinkers and things, and uh, they sort of petered out in the 1960s. Anyway, a lot of these things are around, and they can be great fun, but be prudent. If you like the video, please click like, and comment in the comments if you care to. That all helps the channel. And if you want to support me more materially, there's a link to my Patreon account in the description. I hope this finds you well. Stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you again real soon.